Henry's fourth wife was Anne de la Marque, otherwise known as Anne of Cleves. Anne and Henry were married six months and three days. Her motto was, God send me well to keep. Her badge is a crown above a gold escarbuncle. An escarbuncle consists of eight radiating rods or spokes often used on shields. In ancient warfare, iron bands stemming from the center and radiating outwards were used to strengthen the shield for better protection in battle. So this is a symbol of strength. The crown is a monarch's crown, as Anne was royal by birth. Anne was born in 1515 on either the 22nd of September or more probably the 20th of June in Dusseldorf. She was the second daughter of John III of the House of Lamarck, Duke of Cleves, Berg and Ravensburg, and his wife, Duchess Maria of Julichberg. At the age of 11 in 1527, Anne was betrothed to Francis of Lorraine while he was only 10, but the betrothal was considered unofficial and was cancelled in 1535. In 1538, Henry was urged to take a new wife. The King's Chief Minister Thomas Cromwell suggested the now 25-year-old Anne or her 22-year-old sister, Amelia. Hans Holbein the Younger was dispatched to Cleves to paint portraits of Anne and Amelia. Henry required the artist to be as accurate as possible and not to flatter the sisters. The portraits were most likely accurate. Negotiations with Cleves were in full swing by March 1539. A marriage treaty was signed on the 4th of October of that year. Henry valued education and sophistication in women, like singing, dancing, writing, music and playing musical instruments. But Anne lacked these. Her mother had given her an education suitable for a German noblewoman. She could read and write, but only in German, and was skilled in needlework and liked playing card games. Anne was described by the French ambassador as tall and slim, with blonde hair and freckles, a high forehead and heavy lidded eyes, of middling beauty and a very assured and resolute countenance. The chronicler Edward Hall described Anne as her hair hanging down which was fair yellow and long. She was dressed after the English fashion with a French hood which so set forth her beauty and good visage that every creature rejoiced to behold her. Henry met her privately on New Year's Day 1540 at Rochester Abbey on her journey from Dover. Henry and some of his courtiers following a courtly love tradition went disguised into the room where Anne was staying. It was expected Anne would see through Henry's disguise and see him as the king, but Anne was inexperienced with the game of courtly love and when Henry tried to kiss her, she moved away and ignored him. The king was humiliated by this meeting. That night, Henry urged Cromwell to find a legal way to avoid the marriage. But by this point, doing so was impossible without endangering the vital alliance with the Germans. In his anger and frustration, the king turned on Cromwell, despite Henry's very vocal misgivings. The two were married on the 6th of January, 1540. Henry told Cromwell, It is for my kingdom I must needs, against my will, put my neck in the York. The couple's first night as husband and wife was not a successful one. Henry confided to Cromwell that he had not consummated the marriage, saying, I liked her before not well, but now I like her much worse. In February 1540, speaking to the Countess of Rutland, Anne praised the king as a kind husband, saying, When he comes to my bed, he kisseth me, and he taketh me by the hand, and biddeth me good night, sweetheart, and in the morning kisseth me, and biddeth.
farewell, darling. Lady Rutland responded, Madam, there must be more than this, or it will be long ere we have a Duke of York, which all this realm most desireth. Anne was commanded to leave the court on the 24th of June, and on the 6th of July, she was informed of her husband's decision to reconsider the marriage. Anne was asked for her consent to an annulment, to which she agreed. Cromwell, the moving force behind the marriage, was attained for treason. The marriage was annulled on the 9th of July 1540 on the grounds of non-consummation and her pre-contract to Francis of Lorraine. The former queen received a generous settlement including Richmond Palace and Hever Castle, home of Henry's former in-laws, the Boleyns. Anne of Cleves house in Sussex is just one of many properties she owned, though she never actually lived there. Henry and Anne became good friends. She was an honorary member of the king's family and was referred to as the king's beloved sister. She was invited to court often and out of gratitude for not contesting the annulment, Henry declared that she would be given precedence over all women in England, save his own wife and daughters. In March 1547, Edward VI's Privy Council asked her to move to Penshurst Palace. They pointed out that this was nearer to Hever and the move had been Henry VIII's will. There Anne enjoyed eating, drinking, gambling and entertaining guests. On the 4th of August 1553, Anne wrote to Mary I to congratulate her on her marriage to Philip of Spain. On the 28th of September 1553, when Mary left St James's Palace for Whitehall, she was accompanied by her sister Elizabeth and Anne. Anne also took part in Mary I's coronation procession. These were her last public appearances. In the middle of July 1557, Anne dictated her last will. In it, she mentions her brother, sister and sister-in-law, as well as the future Queen Elizabeth, the Duchess of Suffolk and the Countess of Arundel. She left some money to her servants and asked Mary and Elizabeth to employ them in their households. She was remembered by everyone who served her as a generous and easy-going mistress. Anne died at Chelsea Old Manor on the 16th of July 1557, just eight weeks before her 42nd birthday. The most likely cause of her death was cancer. She was buried in Westminster Abbey on the 3rd of August in what has been described as a somewhat hard to find tomb. On the opposite side of Edward the Confessor's shrine and slightly above eye level for a person of average height. She is the only wife of Henry VIII to be buried in the Abbey. Her epitaph in Westminster Abbey reads simply, Anne of Cleves, Queen of England, born 1515, died 1557. She also has the distinction of being the last of Henry VIII's wives to die, as she outlived Henry's last wife, Catherine Parr, by nine years. She was not the longest lived, however, since Catherine of Aragon was 50 at the time of her death. Henry's fifth wife was Catherine Howard. Catherine and Henry were married one year, three months and 26 days. Her motto as Queen of England was, no other will than his. Catherine's badge is a crown Tudor rose. This is the same as Henry's, except Catherine's does not have a thorn. Henry called Catherine his blushing rose without a thorn. Her character was described as vivacious, giggly and brisk. She displayed great interest in her dance lessons, but would often be distracted during them and make jokes. She also had a nurturing side for animals, especially dogs. She had hazel green eyes and a love of the French fashion. Catherine was just under five feet tall. She must have looked tiny compared to Henry who was over six feet. The French ambassador described her as petite, plump and pretty, demure and dainty, with peaches and cream complexion and Tudor blonde hair. Today we often call this strawberry blonde. It's a light reddish blonde colour. When Catherine's parents married her mother, Joyce Culpepper, 
already had five living children from her first husband, Sir Ralph Lee. She went on to have another six with Catherine's father, Sir Edmund Howard, Catherine being about her mother's tenth child. With little to sustain the family, her father was often reduced to begging for handouts from his more affluent relatives. Soon after the death of her mother in childbirth, Catherine was sent to live with her step-grandmother, Agnes, Dowager Duchess of Norfolk. The Duchess of Norfolk had been a prominent court figure in her day, and many parents in hopes of advancing their children's chances in court placed their children under her care. The Duchess offered a comfortable home at Chesworth House. She did not, however, provide strict supervision for her wards and allowed her granddaughter Catherine to run wild. Catherine attracted many men from an early age and under her grandmother's lax supervision had two affairs. Catherine's music teacher Henry Mannix taught her the virginal and the flute and also tried to seduce his young pupil. Francis Derham, a gentleman in the service of the Duchess, would creep up to share Catherine's bed in the girl's dormitory. A maid who shared the room refused to sleep nearby because of all of the puffing and blowing that came from Catherine's bed. In the spring of 1540, Catherine's uncle, the Duke of Norfolk, arranged for her to go to court as a maid of honour to Anne of Cleves, a leader of the faction of conservative Catholic nobles, the Duke of Norfolk, who had already seen one niece become queen, Anne Boleyn, hoped Catherine's marriage to the king would advance his faction's interests and lead to his own rise in power. By all accounts, the now 49-year-old Henry fell in love at first sight with Catherine. As the annulment of his marriage to Anne of Cleves proceeded, Henry began to court Catherine. The two were married at Altland's Palace on the 20th of July, 1540. The marriage was made public on the 8th of August and prayers were said in the Chapel Royal at Hampton Court Palace. The king embarked on a lavish spending spree to celebrate his marriage. With extensive refurbishments and developments at the Palace of Whitehall, this was followed by more expensive gifts for Christmas at Hampton Court Palace. She enjoyed the masks and balls at court and danced with men while Henry, unable to partner her, looked on. She relished being indulged by her husband and basked in the attention she received from everyone. Anne of Cleves visited Catherine and knelt before her with gifts. In one instance, the two women danced the night away while Henry, with his abscessed leg, retired to bed. Catherine did not get along well with her stepdaughter Mary, who was seven years older than her. Mary refused to acknowledge Catherine as her stepmother and give her the respect she had previously given to Jane Seymour and Anne of Cleves. The tension was so bad that they constantly bickered when in each other's company. In spring 1541, Catherine embarked upon a romance with Henry's favourite male courtier and her first cousin, Thomas Culpepper. He was first introduced into Catherine's personal life in March of 1541, when King Henry went on a trip to Dover and left Catherine at Greenwich. The couple's meetings were arranged by one of Catherine's older ladies-in-waiting, Jane Boleyn, Viscountess Rochford, the widow of Catherine's executed cousin, George Boleyn. On the 30th of June, Catherine and Henry travelled north to York in the hope of meeting James V of Scotland. They arrived at Lincoln on the 9th of August, where Culpepper met Catherine for another secret meeting in her bedchamber. These meetings continued in Pontefract Castle after the court arrived on the 23rd of August. On the 27th of August 1541, Francis Derham approached his former lover seeking employment. Queen Catherine made him her private secretary and then a gentleman usher of the Queen's chamber. Derham was a braggart, unable to keep his mouth shut. He brashly boasted that if the King died, he would marry Catherine. 
When the Archbishop of Canterbury, Thomas Cranmer, presented Henry with evidence of Catherine's indiscretions, the King was stunned. Lady Rochford was interrogated and from fear of being tortured agreed to tell all. She told how she had watched the back stairs as Culpepper made his escape from the Queen's room. On the 2nd of November 1541, Archbishop Thomas Cranmer left a letter for Henry in the Holy Day closet at Hampton Court Palace, detailing Catherine's colourful past and how she had lived most corruptly and sensually. She wrote a letter of confession to the King, begging for his mercy and stating that her relationship with Derham had ended almost a year before the King's Majesty was married to my Lady Anne of Cleves. But the King's Council were now aware of Culpepper, who subsequently confessed to a recent relationship with Catherine. Henry broke down in tears, then asked for his sword, so he could run her through himself. Catherine was stripped of her title as Queen on the 23rd of November, 1541. Culpepper and Derham were charged on the 1st of December 1541 with high treason. They were executed at Tyburn on the 10th of December. Culpepper being beheaded and Derham was hung, drawn and quartered. According to custom, their heads were placed on spikes atop of London Bridge. Catherine herself remained in limbo until Parliament introduced a Bill of Attender on the 29th of January 1542, which was passed on the 7th of February. The Royal Assent by Commission Act of 1541 made it treason and punishable by death for a Queen Consort to fail to disclose her sexual history to the King within 20 days of their marriage, or to incite someone to commit adultery with her. When the Lords of the Council came for her, she panicked and screamed aloud for Henry as they manhandled her into the waiting barge that would escort her to the Tower on Friday the 10th of February. Her flotilla passed under London Bridge, where the heads of Culpepper and Derham were impaled. The night before she was due to be executed, Catherine requested that the executioner's block be brought to her so that she could rehearse her final appearance as Queen. Throughout the night, Catherine practiced placing her head on the block, determined to die with dignity and composure. At around 7 o'clock on Monday, February the 13th, Catherine, dressed in a practical black velvet gown, was escorted to the scaffold. She was so weak she could barely stand, but managed to make a short speech in which she admitted she was justly condemned. She prayed for the king and asked for God's mercy. As she finished her speech, her lady stepped forward. They removed her mantle and placed a linen cap on her head. A blindfold was then placed over her eyes and she was helped to place her head on the block and arrange her skirts. A few moments later, she was beheaded with a single stroke. Lady Rochford was executed immediately after. Both their bodies were buried in an unmarked grave in the nearby chapel of St Peter ad Vincula, where the bodies of Catherine's cousins Anne and George Boleyn also lay. Upon hearing the news of Catherine's execution, Francis I of France wrote a letter to Henry regretting the lewd and naughty behaviour of the Queen and advising him that the lightness of women cannot bend to the honour of men. The sixth and last wife of Henry VIII was Catherine Parr, who went by Kate. Catherine and Henry were married three years, six months, and 16 days. Her motto as Queen was to be useful in all that I do. Catherine's badge is a maiden's head wearing a crown rising from a large Tudor rose. Catherine used her patron saint Saint Catherine of Alexandria as inspiration for her badge. The maiden's head had long been associated with the Parr family Maidens denote purity, redemption, virtuousness and justice. She was known for her love of impressive jewels, sumptuous French and Italian gowns and shoes. 
In one year, she would order 47 different pairs, compared to Amberlynn's 12 pairs. She was about 5 feet 10 inches tall, the tallest of Henry VIII's wives, and she had red gold hair and hazel eyes. Catherine Parr was born in 1512. She was the eldest surviving daughter of Sir Thomas Parr and Maud Green. She was named after Henry's first wife, Catherine of Aragon. Catherine's initial education was similar to other well-born women, but she developed a passion for learning which would continue throughout her life. In 1529, when she was just 17, she married Sir Edward Burrow, who died in the spring of 1533. In the summer of 1534, she married John Neville, 3rd Baron Latimer. He was twice Catherine's age. In October 1536, during the Lincolnshire Rising, Catholic rebels appeared before the Latimer's home, threatening violence if Lord Latimer did not join their efforts to reinstate the links between England and Rome. Catherine watched as her husband was dragged away. Between October 1536 and April 1537, she lived alone in fear with her stepchildren, struggling to survive. Her husband escaped, but during the uprising of the North, Catherine and her stepchildren were held hostage at Snape Castle in Yorkshire. The rebels ransacked the house and sent word to Lord Latimer that if he did not return immediately, they would kill his family. When he returned to the castle, he somehow talked the rebels into releasing his family and leaving. In late 1542, Catherine was left a rich widow. By the 16th of February 1543, she had established herself as part of Lady Mary's household and it was there that Catherine caught the attention of the King. Although she had begun a romantic friendship with Sir Thomas Seymour, the brother of the late Queen Jane Seymour, she saw it as her duty to accept Henry's proposal of marriage. Henry never wanted to stomach a rival gave Thomas Seymour a posting in Brussels to remove him from court. Catherine married Henry on the 12th of July 1543 at Hampton Court Palace. She was the first Queen of England to also be Queen of Ireland. Praised for her virtue, wisdom and gentleness, Catherine provided the closest thing to a stable family life that Henry's three children had known. She proved an effective nurse to Henry, now weakened by oozing leg ulcers. But Catherine did not forget her religious learnings. She secured the release of reformers in prison for their views. She placed leading Protestant thinkers in her own household and that of the heir, Prince Edward. She conducted Bible studies among her ladies-in-waiting and talked religion with the king. Her prayers and meditations, an anthology work published in November 1545, was hailed by scholars and fired female education among the nobility. The second book, The Lamentations of a Sinner, analysed correct behaviour for Christians, observing that married women should be obedient to their husbands. Henry reportedly thanked God for sending him so faithful a spouse and declared to the assembled Privy Council that when he died they should pay Catherine the colossal amount of £7,000 annually and that she would keep all of her jewels she acquired as Queen. The Queen's religious views were viewed with suspicion by anti-Protestant officials. A vigorous religious argument between King and Queen had been overheard by Bishop Stephen Gardiner, who warned Henry against harbouring a serpent within his own bosom. Henry listened, then signed a warrant for Catherine's arrest on grounds of heresy, which would no doubt end with Catherine losing her head. When a loyal servant dropped the warrant outside the Queen's rooms, she collapsed in hysterics. While her ladies discarded banned books on religion, she hastened to the King, who was in the gardens. Henry steered the conversation to religion, commenting that, Ye are become a doctor, Kate, to instruct us. 
Catherine replied, I am but a woman with all the imperfections natural to the weakness of my sex. Therefore, in all matters of doubt and difficulty, I must refer myself to your majesty's better judgment. As to my lord and head, the strategy worked. As the guards came to arrest Catherine just moments later, Henry cried, Nave, fool and beast, and lashed out at them. And Queen Catherine would be given a set of gorgeous new jewels as an apology. Married to King Henry at the age of 31, Catherine was a prime pick for a stepmother. Elizabeth, overlooked by earlier wives, except for Anne of Cleves, forged a close bond with Catherine through their joint love of learning. At 11, Elizabeth translated Catherine's own best-selling prayers and meditations into French, Italian and Latin as a present for her father and stepmother. The 27-year-old Princess Mary joined Catherine's household from the beginning, acting as her faithful friend and companion. Nine-year-old Edward took a steady interest in his stepmother's attempts to improve her Latin and commended her efforts. She was to him very dearest mother. He also was not above begging her to keep the Catholic Mary from all the wiles and enchantments of the evil one. When Henry VIII died on January 28, 1547, Catherine was free to shape her own future. She played no role in the regency for nine-year-old King Edward VI. Her official duties ended and Catherine finally looked to her own happiness. Less than four months after Henry's death, the Queen Dowager married Lord Thomas Seymour. She was scolded by Edward for marrying so soon after his father's death. They lived at Chelsea Manor in London with Catherine's 14-year-old stepdaughter, the Princess Elizabeth. Unknown to Catherine, Thomas became overly friendly with Elizabeth. He would often visit her bedroom to tickle and try and kiss her. Catherine played along once holding Elizabeth down while Thomas cut her gown in strips. The truth of Seymour's infatuation destroyed her friendship with Elizabeth and badly rocked her marriage. In March 1548, at the age of 35, Catherine became pregnant. This pregnancy was a surprise as Catherine had not conceived during her first three marriages. Catherine's daughter, Mary, was born on August 30th, 1548, at Sudley Castle. But Catherine would not survive the birth. Delirious, she raged against her husband for hours on end. Catherine died on the 5th of September, 1548. Her will would leave her ambitious husband all of her property, but he would not long survive her. He was executed for treason on the 20th of March 1549. The fate of her child Mary Seymour is unknown, but she most probably did not survive infancy. Catherine's funeral was held on the 7th of September 1548. Her chief mourner was Lady Jane Grey. She was buried in St Mary's Chapel on the grounds of Sudley Castle. She is the only queen to be buried in a private residence. And this concludes the video. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed this, please click the like button, give it a thumbs up and please subscribe for future videos. Thank you.